great we are live so welcome to the sound of economics the podcast series by Bruegel Brussels-based economic think tank I'm Giuseppe Porcaro head of outreach and governance and I'm Gunther Wolf the director of Bruegel and we are pleased to host today professor Franz Mayer from Bielefeld University who is a jurist and expert of German constitutional law and European integration law Welcome to the Sound of Economics, Sir Professor. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Hello. Today, we want to discuss the judgment pronounced by the Second Senate of the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany on several complaints directed against the public sector purchase program of the European Central Bank. The court found that the federal government and the German Bundestag violated the complainants' rights under the German Basic Law by failing to take steps challenging that the ECB in its decision on the adoption and implementation of the PSPP neither assessed nor substantiated that the measures provided for in these decisions satisfy the principles of proportionality. However, the Federal Constitutional Court did not find that the purchase program, also known commonly as quantitative easing, to be in violation of the prohibition from the EU Treaty of Monetary Financing of Member States' budget. Also, the decision published today does not concern any financial assistance measures taken by the European Union or the ECB in the context of the current coronavirus crisis. I hope I've managed to summarize the main points of the ruling. However, as a non-expert of German constitutional law, I would like to ask Professor Mayer to explain us in more detail what exactly has been decided. And then we will discuss which are the consequences within the German debate and at the European level and in other member states. We would also like to remember, uh, remind our listeners that uh, they can ask questions uh, on Slido as usual uh, with the hashtag QE ruling as it has been advertised widely on social media. So. Professor Mayer, what exactly was decided by the German Constitutional Court and why? Uh, well, thank you again for having me and uh, for giving for having the opportunity to make a couple of remarks on what happened today in Karlsruhe. So I'm uh, just to make that clear, I'm not speaking from Karlsruhe here that at the green screen. <laughs> and in a way, it's quite <laughs> fitting that the green screen seems to kind of break down uh, in a way that's fitting for the mood that most German constitutionalists who work on the EU as well will be in today, because today is a sad day for European law. Uh, for European integration uh, law, but also for German constitutionalism, because in a way what happened today was that the ego of judges uh, prevailed and uh, that harms German legal and political interests in Europe. I would just state uh, as, a, as a in the beginning that what we saw today uh, was an ultra virus act, an act beyond legal powers attributed to an institution, but not from the ECB or the ECJ, but from the German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe. Um, the German Constitutional Court, I would argue, overstepped the boundaries, the limits of its powers. So what was decided? Um, it's really not that easy to summarize that. We have uh, 235 recitals, 110 pages. German Constitutional Court decisions tend to be really narrative. So all I can do, do here, and I really ask, uh, 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 I have to apologize in advance if I'm uh, oversimplifying things. So I can really only give a really very rough outline of things. And uh, as uh, I guess this is one of those decisions once more that you have to read at least a couple of times before fully grasping all the details. Um, um, I, I really hope that um, everybody um, is uh, um, that we operate operate under the understanding that all this all I'm saying is a preliminary assessment. Now, what we can say is that it was about the legality of the PSPP program, right? Um, and uh, the legality of the PSPP program uh, of the ECB was um, um, checked, um, scrutinized under German constitutional law and under EU law by the German Constitutional Court. And all this at the end of a story, um, um, at the end of a story that started uh, quite some time ago, because this entire case started more than two years, three years ago, I guess, um, with the case introduced in Karlsruhe, going to Luxembourg, the European Court of Justice saying it's okay, this is legal. 
uh, going back to Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe reopening the procedure, holding an oral procedure, being very skeptical, and now issuing uh, the decision this morning, uh, finding that actually the ECJ had not properly applied a proportionality test, that thus uh, the ECJ decision was uh, irrelevant, um, uh, that the ECJ uh, was that uh, the, the ECJ decision was thus not binding for the German Constitutional Court, and uh, which allowed the German Constitutional Court to apply a proportionality test on the ECB uh, lessons itself. So um, the ECB um, uh, action, the PSPP program, was scrutinized by the U uh, German uh, Constitutional Court to find that actually. Uh, according to the, their standards, the decision, uh, the, the program was not proportional and thus illegal, uh, being outside the boundaries of the powers of the ECB. They also talk about monetary financing and they are not really happy with the way the ECJ scrutinized the monetary financing issue uh, on PSPP. But at the end, they say, well, that's kind of OK. They, that, that's not... You know, at, in this part of the decision, they don't state that this is ultra virus. So I can briefly say something about the immediate consequences um, and, and the, the mid to long term consequences. The immediate consequences that they clearly say the, the, the Bundesbank is not allowed to participate in the implementation um, of the PSPP program for the time being. And this actually applies to any German uh, institution uh, as uh, the uh, PSPP program is, con is supposed to be considered kind of inexistent in the German legal order. German institutions are not allowed to participate in any shape or form in the PSPP program. Um, this also applies to some extent to the government and to the parliament, to Bundestag and uh, the federal government. They are required and there they say to take steps whatever that means, to ensure that the ECB tries to make sure that this thing becomes proportional, or at least that we get some kind of, uh, you know, um, demonstration that the ECB applies a proportionality test. And that's in a way uh, what turns out to be maybe the, the, the small element of a good message um, in the um, in the uh, uh, in the entire um, uh, decision, um, they say all this applies only after three months. They have some some kind of a three months period where the Bundesbank can try to sort it out with the ECB, where the ECB could furnish their proportionality elements and kind of in in a way uh, repair what they consider to be a problem with uh, PSPP. But then um, further consequences, of course, would be that the, the PEPP program, or the corona related program, would more or less, you know, be scrutinized in very much the same way. That's pretty clear that the same people who brought PSPP to Karlsruhe would also go to Karlsruhe and um, uh, challenge the legality of the PEPP program. And uh, more generally speaking, it's pretty clear that the ECB would operate under the constraints and the legal scrutiny um, of uh, the German Constitutional Court. At least that's what the German Constitutional Court thinks. So let me just give you a couple of elements of comment, maybe, and assessment, which are obviously pretty subjective and, you know, my opinion. Uh, and clearly you will find lots of people who have other opinions, but still, um, well, the first element is that I guess they didn't anticipate that we would have this decision in the midst of a corona crisis. Um, the way they um, um, uh, presented the decision in, in, in some kind of introductory remarks by the president, which are not formally and technically part of the decision, um, uh, illustrates that they are really not feeling comfortable with this kind of coincidence. So the president of the court said in his introductory statement, which is again not technically part of the decision this morning, that uh, whatever they uh, say about uh, PSPP is not supposed to be, uh, you know, addressed to current actions, which is on the one hand a good message, you know, it's 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 a, it's a good message, but on the other hand, it's actually legally not really sound. I mean, basically. 
what they decided in on PSPP does apply to PEPP, and so there will be an, an issue. The more general uh, comment that I would make is that, you know, if you look at this thing, it's actually not really on PSPP. It's not really on the ECB, actually. It's basically addressed uh, to the European Court of Justice. This is really a thing about judicial egos clashing, um, about judicial egoism. Um, this is a, a story that has developed since the Maastricht decision 1993. Uh, this idea of ultra virus acts of the European uh, um, institutions has always been uh, in reality something about ultra virus acts of the ECJ, this idea of who is the ultimate uh, umpire, who is the final uh, arbiter, who has the final right. word. And here we have the German Constitutional Court basically uh, saying it's it's us. There's a lot so of Franz, can I on this yeah, point sure. can I can I just on this point because I think it's a, it's a very important I mean all the points you made are very important but but this point I I'm not sure everybody in Europe that is listening to us now um, understands even the term ultra ultra virus I mean to me uh, and let's say I of course I'm a German so I know this stuff but I mean as an outsider it sounds as if a regional court can just um, uh, confront the legal order of the e EU and actually undermine the legal order of the EU uh, by saying, well, the ultimate interpretation of the European treaties um, is done by um, uh, a, a national or regional court instead of the uh, European Court of Justice. And, um, uh, you know, I, I just to read um, from the declaration uh, of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the, the German Constitutional Court of this morning, I mean, uh, um, uh, just just to, to give you a sense of the language that is used here, also our listeners' a sense. I mean, just uh, I quote here from the English version, the review undertaken by the uh, European Court of Justice with regard to whether or not the ECB decision on the PSPP satisfy the principle of proportionality is not comprehensible. That's the, that's what they say. So 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 basically, I mean, uh, you say it's ego of of a national judge, um, but it seems to me um, the consequences of this for um, the European legal order are quite significant. I mean, what will we say now to a Polish judge um, that will say, oh, by the way, um, the ECJ ruling does not apply to um, uh, the way we deal with uh, judges in Poland. I mean, so isn't isn't the and the consequences of this for the legal integrity of the EU um, aren't they enormous? Of course, it's a it's a huge problem, and it's always been a huge problem. This claim that under certain circumstances a national court can kind of overrule the European Court of Justice, um, it's. You know, in terms of logical reasoning, it's also clear that you can tell this story two ways. You can tell it from a national legal order, and then you can kind of end up with this conclusion that it's ultimately the national legal order that has the, the ultimate say. Um, if you look at it from the European legal order, it's absolutely clear that the treaties don't provide for this kind of overruling of the ECJ. There's an Article 344 uh, um, in the Treaty on Functioning European Union, which basically says that the member states agree that if there's any uh, problem of interpretation of, of EU law, um, they will only solve this problem in the way they agree upon. And the way they agreed upon is there is the European Court of Justice uh, with its role and function under Article 19 of the Treaty on European Union. And if there is a national court uh, challenging this, this is basically a case for treaty infringement. And this is really what I would would, would see coming now. Um, actually, the ECJ, the European Legal Order, the European Commission, all legal players involved at the EU level, they, they there is almost no other option than to really basically sort this out the formal way, because otherwise, uh, you will have a, a fully opened uh, box, a Pandora's box. Uh, some commentators think that what happened today was already the opening of the box. And as you correctly pointed out, there's Poland, there's Hungary, but in, in particular Poland, where you, um, where you will, of course, turn to this kind of argument from the German Constitutional Court just to use it to say, here, look, even the Germans do it. We don't 
we don't have to obey uh, European uh, uh, legal claims of primacy or supremacy of EU law. And so this is really catastrophic. What is likely is uh, la guerre des juges, the war of the uh, of the judges, because the ECJ must react. Um, it's it's a matter of you know kind of survival for the European Court of Justice. They can't let this just you know happen, um, and they have been pretty tough on on courts um, of last resort of the national order um, in the member states uh, recently. The Conseil d'État, for example. Uh, got this uh, message that they violated uh, EU law uh, for not submitting a preliminary reference. So there was a treaty infringement. Uh, the Conseil d'État didn't really like that. Um, uh, but it's happened before. It's happened before in other member states as well, in Scandinavian states, where the, 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 the ECJ was willing to say what the, the, the court of last resort in those member states did or what they said or what they didn't do. Um, was a treaty infringement and they hold the member states responsible. But of course, this kind of war of judges is basically, it's typically a war where you, as often in wars, you will not have any winner. This will have losers on all sides. And that's why it's so tragic. I have a question from the audience, uh, which is linked a little bit on uh, on what we are discussing right now. Um, Audret uh, is Audret is asking uh, in the OMT ruling, Karlsruhe asked a so-called preliminary question to the European Court of Justice in order to interpret the treaty. Why didn't they do the same thing this time? But they did do it. This is at the end of a preliminary reference procedure. Mm. And if you go back in time, uh, this entire story of the ultra virus acts, so this uh, legal acts of the European uh, institutions that they would consider to be beyond the powers transfer to the European level. Um, this is something that goes back to the Maastricht decision uh, where they invented this kind of um, they and then many you know many many years there was just not much happening and then in 2009 in the Lisbon case on the Treaty of Lisbon they kind of reanimated uh, this doctrine of ultra virus and that the, the 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 German public and and the general public was hugely critical so one year later they in the in the Honeywell decision they basically um, stepped back and said, well, actually, we still stick to this ultra virus claim that we have the power to overrule inter alia the European Court of Justice. But if we ever do that, we would first seek um, uh, the opinion of the European Court of Justice and give him kind of the possibility to explain. And so that's what happened here. They submitted a preliminary reference in this case, PSPP, they didn't like the answer, and now they decided that it was ultra virus, that it was ultra virus. And again, it's it's a lot about judicial egos. You know, some people say what really happened is that they just didn't really like the way um, uh, the ECJ answered their preliminary reference in the PSPP case. It's basically um, it's basically some kind of you know, um, um, uh, response to a perceived neglect uh, by the European Court of Justice. This idea that from their perspective it was a big deal to submit preliminary references. So it's only the second preliminary reference in the history of the, um, of the European uh, Court of Justice uh, and, and the German Constitutional Court. So, um, and the first one was OMT. And now the second one kind of completely derailed. Can we zoom in a bit on on the uh, on the consequences um, and understand a bit bit more uh, what was actually decided? So um, on the one hand, the court says um, it doesn't look like monetary financing. On the other hand, it says um, the ECB, neither the ECB nor the uh, European Court of Justice have assessed um, the proportionality and the side effects um, of um, uh, quantitative easing. I mean, my first reaction when I, I read this is that, of course, judges haven't assessed it because they can't. I mean, it's outside of their competence. But to claim that the ECB um, hasn't assessed um, these consequences, to me, is just a sign that they, they, they have no clue of what a central bank is doing. I mean, central banks uh, do these kind of assessments um, 
on a continuous basis with uh, a whole load of 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 models and uh, and 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 uh, empirical and uh, theoretical analysis so so this assessment is being done and they asked then uh, that um, the ecb uh, should now explain in the next three months um, why this is actually uh, a proportional um, action so why the pspp program actually does make sense to achieve the primary mandate um, uh, of the ecb isabel schnabel um, the German ECB uh, uh, governing uh, council member um, has been to Karlsruhe um, a few a few uh, weeks ago and has explained in quite some detail uh, why um, PSPP um, actually does make sense and does fulfill a monetary policy purpose of achieving the inflation targets. So there has been long explanations by her. Um, there's lots of papers published. Um, what else can the ECB do, should the ECB do, and uh, does it actually stand a chance uh, to explain uh, and uh, that what it does actually does make sense? And um, whom does the ECB actually have to convince now? Is it the, the Bundesverfassungsgericht that will then uh, receive all the models and all the assessments from the ECB and then say, oh, finally, uh, it makes sense what you are doing. It does actually have an influence on, on, on inflation. Or I mean, how how is this gonna this this three months period now gonna gonna look like practically? If you can give us some insights from your point of view on this. Well, I guess there's really a number of things that you can say on the the points you just raised. Um, the the first thing is that it's probably quite likely that um, um, the ECB, although they will not really like it, uh, um, they they will try to issue some kind of you know. Uh, a more substantive uh, proportionality test. And then we will see how this will go on. Of course, it's not really unlikely that the same people who brought this initial case to Karlsruhe uh, will just go back to Karlsruhe because, again, my, my reading of this is for them, it's not really a concern of this particular program. The people who, who brought this to Karlsruhe are, are Euro and, and EU skeptics, and so they will just try to go back uh, to Karlsruhe just for um, you know to, to, in order to have more publicity and all that. So it's 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 quite sure that the, uh, the Karlsruhe will probably address this again. But I I would expect them to be rather generous on whatever the ECB will you know if if the ECB tries in a way to, to, to follow um, a kind of their lead, that would already be a huge success for them to some respect. And so I would, I would expect them to be rather generous. Uh, and again, we have to see that uh, one of the judges, the president actually, uh, will leave the court. So the court next tomorrow. time will be um, tomorrow, actually. It was his last day, last decision. Um, I, I don't think it's a good exit, but OK. Um, his choice. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the next time the court will have to decide on this, it will be slightly different. So there's one judge being replaced, but I'm not really too optimistic that, uh, you know, the, 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 whoever comes to replace uh, uh, school will be that more, much more uh, open um, uh, to understanding what this is all about in the ECB and European integration, etc. And, and again, one judge is just one judge of eight. So that's not really much. Um, then your question, what, what really do they expect? Well, probably one thing that one should also know and see is that proportionality is just the core concept of German constitutional law. So in a way, um, basically everything uh, in German constitutional law, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, ends in this kind of proportionality argument and this kind of balancing thing between different values at stake. And this is where the, th the, the approach uh, of the German Constitutional Court in this decision really becomes problematic because if it's about balancing different interests, uh, it's clearly a problem if you give a national court um, the German Constitutional Court, this role, because by definition, the German Constitutional Court will have a German perspective, and it will be a very limited perspective. 
And the ECB, uh, by definition, that's its task, will have a European perspective. And that's why the ECB should do this balancing test and not the German Constitutional Court. But that also means that ultimately um, it's pretty clear that they will not really come to similar results when applying a proportionality test because they will ha just kind of use different elements for the balancing. And that's uh, that's the huge, uh, I, I guess, the logical gap in their entire reasoning that they believe that what they see is what everybody else sees. So they see a problem with the German real estate market. They see a problem with the German, I don't know, you know, the house owners, um, the, the, the people, um, you know, who try to make sense of their savings here in Germany. And, and they they would have wanted the ECB to really take this seriously into consideration, to give it some way to balance it against all the other things at stake. But, you know, from the perspective of the ECB, this is just one tiny, well, probably not tiny, but just one element in, in, in a huge complicated field of, of elements that have to be taken into consideration. And uh, Gunstrom, I totally agree with you. It's totally absurd to think that the ECB didn't reflect on what the consequences of that would be. And it's in a way also a clash of, of cultures between lawyers mm. and economists, of course. And that's something that was pretty visible in, in the oral procedure um, um, uh, last year on the, uh, after the case came back from Luxembourg, they reopened the procedure and they had a hearing in Karlsruhe. And that was just, you know, a, a, a textbook example of how lawyers and economists live on different planets. And, and then here we have a case of lawyers trying in a way to interfere in something which ultimately, of course, there is a legal framework. Yes, agreed. But it's something that is really that belongs to the world of economics and, and the, the sound answer. And that's something that I personally have been arguing since since, you know, 2011, when I was counsel for the German parliament in the very first euro uh, case uh, concerning the aid accorded to Greece. And I, I argued this is about judicial self-restraint, you know, but the moment I argued that in the oral procedure in 2011 in court, I saw kind of, you know, the faces of the judges kind of closing. They didn't want to hear about that. Judicial self-restraint was definitely not their thing. And that's that's really visible in that case here. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question from Gregory who said, but should the ECB enter that game with the German constitutional court and answer them on proportionality and risk opening the Pandora box as mentioned? It's a little bit like, should the ECB really do that? It's a big question. Um, I mean, you know, we had OMT and there the ECB agreed to appear in the case. So they took part in the oral proceeding. Uh, they explained. Uh, I, I was not sure at the time whether that was really the good approach, because as I'm saying, uh, the playing field of the ECB is the Eurozone and not one member state and the concerns of one member state and, and, and the limited view of one member state on the world. And um, in a way, I found it uh, logical that in the uh, PSPP case, they didn't appear um, hmm. in, in, the, in the proceedings. They just wouldn't participate. They left it to the Bundesbank to argue uh, the central bank perspective. Hmm. Now, there again, you know, it's, it's a lot about psychology on hmm. egos and on, 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 you know, this kind of thing. It was really, you know, at the oral hearings, you could feel how the judges, they just didn't, you know, appreciate the ECB just not showing up and leaving it all to the Bundesbank, which put the Bundesbank in the bizarre position that they have to defend a position that actually they themselves are critical of when it comes to right. the ECB. But I, my, my perception was they did a pretty fair job there. So... Now, it's a little bit exactly the situation, you know, should they, you know, play the game and respond and say, okay, understood, we'll do a proportionality test, or should they just ignore them and find a way to pursue PSPP, uh, you know, without the Bundesbank, if that is even necessary, you know, on the very technical level, um, um, and, and just, you know, say this is not our playing field, you know, let that court just have mm. their thing. And mm. 
I, you know, in a way, it's it's probably a, a pragmatic approach would say, well, let them, they want to have a proportionality test and, and see that we have some ideas of what consequences are. And again, Guntram, as you say, it's pretty sure and clear that they do have this kind of reflection somewhere on file. So I guess they will they will pursue a pragmatic approach. And again, if, so, it, if I'm correct, that it's basically mm -hmm. a, a fight against, you know, between the German Constitutional Court and the European Court of Justice, um, the ECB will ultimately not really harm their standing. Can we just zoom in um, a bit on on the ECB and the euro system? I mean, uh, as you, of course, the, the Bundesbank is part of the euro system, the German Central Bank. Um, and um, as a German Central Bank, um, it uh, is a German institution, so it is subject to what um, the German Constitutional Court um, is saying, but at the same time, it's part of the Euro system and is therefore supposed um, and is, has so far always implemented um, ECB decisions that were taken in the governing council, even if the Bundesbank governor, uh, Jens Weidmann or his predecessors, did not agree with, uh, with, the, with the governing council decision. Once the decision was taken in the governing council, it has always implemented the decision in terms of monetary policy decisions. Now we have this, as we uh, just discussed, this clash between two different uh, legal systems, between two different courts. Um, uh, um, how will this clash affect the Bundesbank's uh, position um, in, in this game? I mean, at what stage will they have to stop actually implementing uh, joint ECB decisions? And at what stage is the singleness of ECB monetary policy actually endangered? Yeah, again, it's a good question. Um, well, on the very technical level, again, uh, the German Constitutional Court said, well, we will give you three months to sort it out. So they call it a transition period or something. So there are three months where basically the Bundesbank can basically go on um, uh, as if the, the decision never happened. And again, I would expect that all uh, players involved at the central bank uh, level will try to find a pragmatic solution and not uh, let it come to the point where the Bundesbank really has to kind of, you know, in terms of loyalty, declare that its loyalties lie with the German constitutional order or that the loyalty lies with the um, euro uh, system, um, they, they will try to avoid this kind of either or situation. But on a theoretical, um, uh, and maybe in the future, not that theoretical level, it's true. It's, 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 a, it's a decision that at some point they, they would have to make. Um, and, and that's in a way not a bug, but it's a feature of the system. I mean, that's the whole idea of it, that you're part of you know two levels of, of monetary governance. And again, in a way, the, the, the mere fact to put the Bundesbank in this kind of impossible decision is, is taken alone. It's, it's something that uh, this, this uh, decision of the German Constitution Court uh, uh, must be really you know, critiqued for. It's... So let me push you one, one more, uh, a bit more into uh, even extremer territory. So, so suppose the, the Bundesbank, um, uh, follows uh, follows the uh, the German court because it's a German institution and because Jens Weidmann uh, personally even thinks um, that's the right thing to do, and the ECB as a uh, as an institution just decides to um, to take over the, the 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 things that normally the Bundesbank would do. I mean, so so basically the ECB can can go on the bond markets and buy German bonds uh, in proportion to, uh, and even decide, the governing council could even decide that from now on, since the national road doesn't work, uh, the ECB as the European institution buys sovereign debts um, of all uh, its member states, uh, all the Eurozone member states, according to capital key. And, um, you know, uh, also as the PEP, um, I mean, in the PEP program, the. Um, this um, this uh, this uh, thirty three percent uh, issuer limit um, has also been scrapped. So they just they just go ahead and and do this centrally out of um, Frankfurt, not out of the Bundesbank, but out of um, uh, this Ost end, uh, the east end of, of Frankfurt. Um, what 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 happens? I mean, at, uh, how can what can the the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the German Constitution Court, really do at that stage? I mean. Um, 
uh, okay, they can call on Berlin to to raise concerns. Berlin raises concerns, fine. But you know, the ECB governing council just continues, uh, and the ECB just continues doing its job. So, so at the end of the day, where can I mean, what's the end game here? Where can this end um, from a legal point of view? Yeah, again, this is one of the the, the big questions that, obviously, um, as it concerns the future, I don't really have a sure answer for. Um, but it points again to the basic flaw of the entire reasoning. The ECB is independent and it's supposed to be independent. It's not a bug, it's a feature. The Germans wanted it to be independent like this. And it doesn't really make sense to come up with this kind of legalese frameworking of an independent institution. Um, and, you know, if, if you really think this through, uh, they didn't, on the surface, the trick is that they say this is unconstitutional, meaning it's um, uh, um, kind of in conflict with German constitutional law, but they also make a statement about the legality under EU law. They basically also say this is uh, violating EU law. And this is, of course, it's highly destabilizing because this is not only by kind of, you know, a thing between the German legal order and the EU legal order, but this is kind of basically saying that, you know, this act is kind of, yeah, it's ill. It's not, you know, it's not sound uh, also in the relationship of the EU legal order with all the other member states legal order. This has some kind of, you know, some kind of, you know, 360 degree effect. And, and this is so dangerous. And if you think this through, is it, could it really be conceivable that, that, you know, Germany participates in, in some endeavor where, you know, one of the main institution keeps, that would be the perspective, uh, illegal acts, uh, you know, and um, I, I, I'm, again, I'm not, and you said it as well, I'm not really sure whether they really grasp, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of um, consequences of, of what they are doing here, but saying that, um, parts of the ECB governance action is illegal under the rules of the ECB governance system of EU law is really a highly dangerous thing. And if they, you know, in, in, you know, if they, if they really stick to their perspective, this would ultimately also mean that it remains in violation of German constitutional law, which in a way is also something that you couldn't kind of say well let's live with it which in ultimately you would have to solve this somehow well in their perspective how can you solve this i mean you can change the rules you can change the rules of eu law you can change the treaties yeah. you can change the rules of german constitutional law um and both is not really easy and and the and the last and the, the other option is you know change behavior change <laughs> action don't do this anymore and there again, you would have a lot of uh, not only economists, just a lot of people saying, well, but that's that's what the ECB, in a way, in some situations is supposed to do. So there is no clear way out of this. And this remains a huge uh, risk and in that sense, an instable situation. But I think Since it's are... probably fair, uh, oh, Giuseppe, you will ask a question, yeah. but I mean, yeah. just to give my my comment on this, I mean, I... My, my sense is that the ruling is, is so big. Um, and as you say, it's 110 pages. We will have to read it more than once um, to fully digest it. But I think my sense is the ruling is so big that um, this whole issue of um, EU treaty reform and what the Eurozone will do um, with itself, um, will it create um, some fiscal counterpart um, to uh, the ECB and will we see also um, a change of um, the mandate and the scope of what the ECB can or cannot do. I mean, I think that this, at the end of the day, I think this will be back on the table rather sooner than later. So the question of EU treaty reform, um, getting um, a fiscal uh, counterpart to the ECB, it seems to me it's been in the discussion for many, many years and um, the uh, the uh, Bundesverfassungsricht, the German Constitutional Court, uh, pushes that discussion um, and uh, and forces us to to reconsider this um, option actually uh, much more strongly than before. Yeah, I would like also to um, to read some of the questions from the audience because uh, we are going to go soon towards the the end of uh, of this episode. 
uh, especially I will bundle a, a couple of them because they, they go exactly in that direction of the discussion. First of all, the direction of uh, the debate around the treaty and uh, uh, is there a, a reopening of, of the issue about, uh, about the treaty, uh, likely or not likely in the medium term as a consequence of this kind of rule, uh, this kind of judgment, which is exactly what Guntram has just uh, um, hinted. And uh, uh, another question that, uh, that is uh, floating around is um, if this, um, this sort of uh, uh, ruling uh, is playing to the objectives of those who wish to wage a high profile political war in Germany, in brackets, against the euro. And then I have uh, also a question, let's say from a southerner perspective about uh, what is the consequence in the immediate term and perhaps this uh, a little bit more concrete of uh, of the um, of this ruling in terms of uh, the quantitative easing uh, program, especially indeed from the perspective of a country of the south that might be benefiting of this program right right now. Well, first on the treaties. Um... Well, th there's an additional problem, and, and you see there are lots of problems out there, but uh, the additional problem with this entire uh, saga of the German Constitutional Court uh, um, being Eurosceptic uh, is that the way they set up their argument, it's not easy to overcome uh, with treaty change or constitutional law change because they locate the starting point of their argument in the democracy principle of the German constitution um, in a way uh, that you can't overcome this by constitutional amendment. So where in other member states, like mm. say France, if you change the treaties and then the Conseil Constitutionnel finds out this, there's a problem with the French constitution here, they can change the French constitution more or less without any problem. And without going to the details, because the details are really tricky and that's, again, part of the problem that is such a complicated line of thought that they have here. But the way they set this up, it's it's not even the third, the two third majority uh, in German parliaments that will be able to change this. And this is, of course, a huge problem. Um, so I would still argue that treaty change. Um, I'm so, sorry to interrupt. Why, why so? Because you, you, you may find out that you consider treaty change that is not compatible with the German constitution as it stands. And that would, could only happen if the Germans gave themselves a new constitution. And that would yeah, really but be... Why it's not possible to change the German constitution as all the constitutions because, have been changed as you've been, uh, you've been pointing well, out. Uh, that's that's you know, all the member states, all the member states changed their constitution in order to fulfill the EU treaties. Yeah, but you have a provision in the German constitution which says that base, some basic core elements of the German constitution cannot be amended. It's a consequence of the German constitution being a post-dictatorship constitution. So in 1949, um, uh, the founders of the German constitutional order in 1949 didn't really trust uh, their fellow Germans and they put kind of, you know, safeguards into the, the text uh, that basically mean that there are certain things that you cannot overcome by amending the constitution. You can always just make a new constitution, but remember, Germany didn't even um, get a new constitution after reunification. So a completely new constitution for Germany would be a major step. So this is really a, a, a big problem with the German constitution court, you know, kind of linking all kinds of things to this kind of core, which cannot be amended. And this is in legal terms, and then obviously also in political terms, because the politicians know about that, and, and they can keep saying that certain treaty um, uh, amendments are a no-starter, because there's this thing about the German constitution that cannot be amended. So this is a huge, uh, a huge problem. The second thing about um, how will this play out in Germany? Um, well, again, this is an as many questions nowadays that concern politics a really open question, which will also uh, um, depend on how the post uh, Corona uh, order in the European Union will look like. Um, 
whether there is really this uh, kind of fallback to a more nationalist uh, approach of things, or if it will be the opposite, that the lesson that we all learn is that we need we need more multilateralism, and in that sense also more even more European integration. Um, um, we will see. Um, I'm not really sure, although they claim to do that, that the German Constitution Court really speaks for the silent majority of Germans. That was one of the standard arguments that you often hear the judges speaking or writing extrajudicially in newspaper interviews or so. They say, we defend, you know, the ordinary Germans' uh, view, skepticism on the euro. We don't want to pay for the southerners. You know, this kind of crude populist argument uh, that brought us uh, the, the right-wing populists, the AfD. Um, so... I, I don't. I'm, I'm. I still believe that the majority of Germans is not really in sync with this kind of skepticism. This is a very particular thing with individual judges. Well, and as as far as quantitative easing is concerned, well, as I said, um, the 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 short term consequences are very limited. And uh, again, I'm pretty sure that the um, the ECB and and the um, the ECB system, they will try to find a pragmatic way uh, to move on. And, and, and that's probably one of the few positive aspects of these days. I mean, the immediate danger of a, a total breakdown of the euro system is just not there. Um, uh, there's a lot of symbolism. Uh, there's a lot of language. And uh, Gunjam, you said it, it's a long decision and we'll have to dig through it. Um, unfortunately, there is no dissenting opinion, although the decision was taken seven to one. So there was one judge uh, who was not, uh, um, you know, who didn't want to, 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 to vote for this decision. And they can issue the judges in that case uh, um, a dissenting opinion, but uh, they are not obliged to. But I, I would have liked to see a dissenting opinion because that would, that, that would have showed, shown you know, the alternative approach. I mean, assuming that uh, the dissenter was more, you know, in line with the pro-European argument and not even more nationalistic than the seven others. Of course, that we don't know. But um, so that's a missed opportunity. <laughs> but uh, I repeat myself, this was not the last decision coming from Karlsruhe. So there will be more opportunities either for really good decisions or at least for good dissenting opinions. Thank you. And Guntram, do you want to have some last reflection before we close this uh, episode? No, no, indeed. I, I think I think this was a, a great discussion, and I, I perhaps just want to to end on this observation: why this fiscal um, union discussion will will become more important now. I think the reason is really that. Um, uh, one way or another, uh, what Katsu has done will um, limit um, directly or indirectly um, the uh, action room uh, of the ECB. We have discussed today how much that action room will be will be reduced, um, and I think this is still uh, an ongoing debate. We don't know yet the full consequences. I think and financial markets so far have taken it relatively uh, moderately. I mean, we've seen an increase in spreads uh, somewhat, but not a very big increase in spreads um, since the ruling was announced. So, so, um, so the full impact on the capacity of the ECB to do its job um, of really uh, looking after the Eurozone economy, the inflation in the Eurozone economy, support the financial markets, um, in uh, the monetary transmission mechanism, this uh, this um, this uh, will be constrained. But you know, the, the if it's constrained to a significant extent, uh, then you know the issue of um, having a eurozone safe asset um, that's issued uh, by eurozone governments, uh, uh, not uh, individually but collectively through some sort of a eurozone treasury to actually complete financial markets and have a more stable um, financial system uh, will be fully back on the table. And so ultimately, I think um, this ruling uh, pushes us to, uh, to accelerate that discussion um, because typically monetary unions uh, survive with, uh, with a fiscal union and a fiscal union means um, that you have to uh, get the political union right and then you basically have to agree 
on, on basic political principles of accountability, of decision-making powers, um, uh, of um, also order of legal order. And so this discussion, I think, uh, is, is a discussion that was there. And I think it will come back uh, with stronger force um, uh, because of this ruling of, of the ECJ, uh, of the European Court of Justice. And indeed, this discussion will continue. And we at Bruegel, we are going to continue monitoring it and engage within uh, this discussion, uh, not only through our events and podcasts, but as well with our analysis that uh, you can read at, on our website, www.bruegel.org. And on this note, I would like to thank uh, all our listeners for having engaged in this uh, conversation. I would like to thank Professor Mayer and, uh, and Guntram for, uh, for their contribution to the discussion today. And uh, until next time, thank you. Bye-bye.